Michael, to uh, Stephen and Robert and their colleagues for organising today's event and once again for inviting me along to do presentations such as this. It's deli a delight to work with Stuart Title. For those of you that haven't looked at Stuart Title's website recently, please do so. They're constantly sort of updating products and providing useful information for practitioners, as well as organizing CPD events such as this. So a massive thank you to them. And uh, again, a reminder to people that Stuart Title are sponsoring these events. And therefore, if we can support Stuart Title however we can, that's a great thing. So CQS then, what we're going to talk about today. I want to look, as I mentioned in my sort of introduction, at the sort of the, the bigger picture relating to CQS, what it's doing, what the reform and what the changes have done, and then to look at how this impacts on conveyancing life and conveyancing work. As I always do in presentations such as this, I refer you to useful websites. And again, given what we're going to be talking about today, I think the Leasehold Advisory Service, Leasehold Knowledge Partnership and Association of Residential Managing Agents are important sites to look at when we start talking about the changes to CQS in connection with leaseholds. And in particular, change of emphasis relating to leasehold transactions and the advice that we give our clients relating to those transactions. All of those sites are well worth a look at. All are free other than Property Law UK, which is a subscription service. So I want to talk a little bit about Lenders Handbook. I want to talk about changes to CQS guidance, and I want to give you my sort of slant on things. And remember, I come at this from a tra transactional perspective. So I'm looking at how it impacts on the work that we do. As far as advice relating to um, CQS assessments, etc. Um, I have contacts and colleagues, Tracy Taylor in particular, being a very good friend of mine who is uh, able to provide advice with regard to what happens on assessments, etc. But I'm looking at purely and simply what CQS is, what the changes are, and how it impacts on practitioners. The Conveyancing Quality Scheme was designed and to, to an extent achieves the following it improves and maintains quality. It enables practitioners to attract and retain business and hopefully adopting CQS and maintaining CQS standards will prevent claims and complaints. Now, I know from speaking to practitioners on many occasions that to an extent it's regarded as a sort of series of hoops that have to be overcome. And to an extent, there's sort of some reluctance in uh, accepting that there is benefit as a consequence of that hoop jumping exercise. But I think at its very heart, it's a good thing. At its heart, it's a very positive thing. And although there is a lot of work to be done relating to CQS standards with regard to the upkeep of those standards and the concerns, fears and work involved with relating to CQS assessments, etc., I think on balance, there's more benefit than detriment. But I think the important thing from the changes that we saw on the 1st of May is really a change in emphasis. And the, the idea is that CQS isn't simply a manual, it isn't simply a series of processes and procedures where we have a sort of book or a textbook or a file or a system on our PC that we can show everyone and show anyone that's interested that we comply with CQS. I think the change in emphasis is let's have a look at files to make sure the procedures and processes that uh, are within the systems are actually put into place and are in fact operational. So I think that's the important thing from the, the, the sort of thrust of what the changes to CQS were designed to do. There are some detailed points which I'm gonna share with you as we progress this morning. What we've seen are some structural changes. Firstly, emphasis as of the 1st of May to structure and strategy and the emphasis on people management. And some people have commented that what we've seen with regard to CQS guidance is a sort of outing of supervision and operational risk management. And the point I would labour there and emphasise there is that is not the case. Although there are changes and emphasis on structure, strategy and people management, that's not to say that CQS now has sort of abandoned the requirement for supervision and operational risk management. Far from it. As we'll see, both are just as significant as ever. There are new provisions within the CQS guidance relating to registers of plans and policies. Why? To show that we're reviewing and we're constantly assessing the plans and policies that we have in place, that we're aware of changes with regard to practice and changes with regard to risk, and that what we've got is a fluidity 
with regard to our plans and policies. So if we have registers, we can show when the plans and policies have been reviewed and when they've been updated. Useful exercise, again, the idea is that plans, policies, procedures, etc., should not be cast in stone. The conveyancing process is in a constant change and a constant state of flux. We need to be aware of it. And as far as CQS is concerned, again, good practices are reviewing, assessing, um, comparing data and information historically with current data and information and keeping things under review and assessing where change is appropriate or necessary. New provisions relating to induction processes with regard to onboarding clients and also in connection with uh, taking on staff. A requirement for an ANL risk assessment on every file and a fraud risk assessment on every file. So it's not a question of having a policy with regard to ANL risk or a, a policy relating to fraud risk, but evidence that this uh, policy, this practice, this procedure that we've got, that we're required to have, is being utilised by every fee owner on every file. I think that's one of the big takeaways from the changes up on the 1st of May. The second thing that's quite interesting is with regard to SDLT, a sort of requirement for the provision of information for clients relating to SDLT liability and a change of understanding with regard to fee owners. We're going to explore that in some detail. As far as dealing with leasehold matters, again, some changes and a requirement to make sure that clients are aware of the bigger picture, the differential between freehold and leasehold, the disadvantage of leasehold ownership. And again, that's significant. And again, that's something I think that's overlooked. Because leasehold conveyancing is quite complex, because there may be only limited numbers of fearners within a department actually dealing with leasehold transactions, there is a danger that we get so wrapped up in the transaction with looking at the lease and with looking at the particular circumstances that we take it as read that our clients understand the radical difference between freehold and leasehold ownership. We've got to make sure clients are aware of that radical difference, aware of these distinct disadvantages and the awareness of the statutory protection that Parliament has attempted to introduce to protect leaseholders from landlords and to give them a, a more level playing field with regard to disputes. There are also new provisions dealing with lenders, one of which is quite critical. So all of those things I think we need to be aware of. Some of them today we're going to sort of delve into some detail in that connection. There are confusions with regard to the changes that CQS have made, namely, is it necessary now to provide cost estimates? Well, of course it is. Is it necessary for fee and status to be revealed in connection with our engagement letters? Answer, yes, it is. Is there any change to that? And compliance with SRA codes of conduct and CPMS is a given. So just because there is an emphasis on any of these three points that I make on slide here, does not mean that uh, the CQS and indeed practices can sort of stop thinking about all of these issues. There's other legislation and the regulation that would require a provision relating to cost estimate, and we're all familiar these days with the need for transparency. As far as fear and status is concerned, again, important that clients are aware of who's dealing with their files, what their status is, and what line management is in place relating to supervision, etc. So all of those things, I don't think there should be any confusion about. The position is exactly the same as it ever was, although CQS and the guidance may change emphasis, the sort of fundamentals relating to good conveyancing practice remain in my view. Interestingly, when we look at definitions relating to the CQS guidance, there are some quite interesting changes. First of all, when there's reference to personnel, there's emphasis and reference to part-time staff and consultants. So as far as part-time staff are concerned, that got me thinking about what about locums and what about consultants that sort of are on the periphery of our department? Well, what's the position with them? Well, the point is that CQS applies across the board and it's important to make sure that if we have part-time staff, if we have locums working for us, if we have consultants, even though their role may be very limited, it's important that they're aware of our systems and processes. As far as plans are concerned and mapping, the idea is that uh, procedures, practices and the plans that we have in connection with our practice are mapped so that we can keep 
uh, uh, we can be aware of what we're attempting to do and we are keeping things under review as our systems and processes evolve as the data that we are re 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 recalling from the work that we're doing is utilized in connection with management decision making policies should be a documented general approach but the important thing is that with regard to policies and procedures the descriptions that are contained within the cqs and cqs guidance are acted upon as i've highlighted on slide here that is a significant and important point and again just reveals this fact that we don't just simply have a cqs file we don't simply get a cqs accreditation and then put things to one side only to be got out where there is an assessment what we're doing is constantly utilizing the materials the practice the procedure the policies that we have for our day-to-day -day file management and our day-to-day -day conveyancing activities within the department as far as people management is concerned well hurrah the cqs emphasizes the need for training the need for um active training that sort of personalized and developed for a department and developed for individual firms and the fact that training is kept under review so where when we're recruiting staff when we're so reallocating staff it's important to bear in mind there should be training programs for the staff that are personal to the team when we're taking on new types of work when we're increasing workload we need to manage what sort of training would be appropriate for our staff when we're uh, engaging and or onboarding new systems and processes to assist us with the conveyancing work that we're doing again staff need training and again staff need to be aware of a sort of common method of practice common systems and processes that the firm has adopted via cqs that everyone must adhere to and deal with the on the issue of uh, people management there's ev emphasis to communication procedures particularly with regard to banks to make sure that we're communicating effectively and safely with banks under the third parties and again as far as people management is concerned a need to fear as members of staff to be aware of electronic formats for documentation electronic signatures and the safety measures that can be put in place to assist in that regard Again, as far as people management is concerned, it's a question of awareness of electronic uh, verification, electronic verification relating to ID, electronic signatures and the production of electronic documentation. One of the things that I'm seeing is a sort of uh, a broadening acceptance of the use of electronic verification for client identity purposes. And again, you're seeing a lot of sort of um, mute music. Uh, in connection with the requirement for electronic signatures if you're interested in the use of electronic signatures and you want to see where i think electronic signatures will ultimately get in connection with residential conveyancing have a look at the city of london law society's land law committee's uh, website on the basis that they have detailed information about the use of electronic signatures in commercial transactions commercial property transactions and i think that format that procedure that protocol will ultimately be the basis of the protocol that would be used for electronic signatures in conveyancing in residential conveyancing uh, one of the things that i'm asked about in that connection from time to time is what happens if one firm is getting their clients electronic signature to a document and your firm isn't your firm is uh, adopting the the, the old-fashioned uh, process of getting a wet signature to a document well the answer there is to use a counterpart document uh, again, the land registry seemed fairly comfortable with that as a concept. But what we're going to see, I think, with regard to electronic signatures is that the buyer's conveyance are taking the lead in choosing the platform that's going to be used for electronic signature and the seller's conveyance are going along with the use of that platform. But that's for the future. But we're seeing it already. And I think CQS is emphasising that there needs to be training, there needs to be familiarity with the use of electronic documents, electronic verification, client ID and electronic signatures too. As far as learning and development is concerned, it's not just fear and training, but it's supervision and management training, and it's the creation of learning and development plans. And the important aspect with regard to this is that uh, our fear and members of staff should be on a journey uh, from the sort of uh, inception 
into the department from their sort of role as I said, perhaps a relatively junior Fiona up until as they get more and more experience, perhaps uh, supervisory and management roles within the department and the need for training for that specific role or specific purpose. Learning and development plans for the organisation and learning development plans for Fiona are the key and training with regard to CQS. Uh, the fact that we've got these changes as of the 1st of May, important that members of staff are aware of what those changes are and how those changes impact on the work that conveyances do. As far as risk management is concerned, again, nothing new here, the idea of compliance plans and risk registers and risk management roles and the need to communicate risk information upwards and downwards uh, among the sort of chain of command, as it were, with regard to a conveyancing team. All of that is nothing new, as I mentioned. What is new, however, is the points that were made with regard to the changes in guidance as of the 1st of May about managing instructions, about making sure that we're taking on matters that we are comfortable with. And here, again, from sort of bitter experience in looking at firms, what I notice is that some firms have sort of sales teams and onboarding teams that take over responsibility for attracting clients or dealing with third party referrals, setting the, the client up as a client of the firm and then handing over instructions to firmers that are going to be dealing with the transactions. And sometimes there's a bit of a mismatch between what the sales team is saying or what the onboarding team is saying and what firmers are having to deal with. So I think it's important that if we have sales staff or on onboarding staff that aren't fearners, that they're aware of the conveyancing process and they know what to ask. Because I have seen situations where promises have been made that can't possibly be kept by fearners, putting fearners in a difficult position and getting uh, clients somewhat aggrieved on the basis that when they were onboarded, they were told something that now looks as if it can't happen. So managing instructions, managing client expectations when instructions are received are important and managing how work is referred making sure that our third party referrers are aware of uh, the, the role that we have with regard to conveyancing, aware of the constraints and issues that we encounter as part of the conveyancing process so that they're not generating sort of false hopes for clients. At the end of the day, I'd much rather under promise and over deliver in every aspect of the conveyancing process. And that goes from managing instructions to throughout the life of the transaction. The requirement to list and allocate work types to individual firms again is important and again perhaps this is something that's overlooked and therefore it's important that it's drawn to firms and members of, of the conveyancing department's attention. The idea that we should be drawing up lists to determine what sort of work firms can take on and making sure that firms are comfortable with the work that's being allocated to them to having systems and processes that where there's a difficult file or a complex issue arising that an appropriate member of staff is able to take on the matter or adopt additional supervision to make sure the fear they're dealing with the matter isn't exposed or overexposed. Identifying transactions that won't be taken on either because the work the firm doesn't have the appropriate expertise or that there aren't there isn't fear availability or time availability to take on transactions or there are transactions that are high risk. And I think the important thing here is that there is monitoring of the sorts of transactions that are being taken on, assessment of the type of work and assessment as to whether or not firmers are comfortable with that work. A requirement to detail and review generic risk and then also to look at specific risk relating to files. And again, the CQS highlights the need for key date monitoring. And on that point, again, I always emphasize to fearners that we shouldn't be monitoring. We shouldn't have systems and processes that flag up the file and final day for doing something. So the final day of the expiry of the priority period for our search, for example, we should have a system that enables us to flag up, have a say in an amber warning in connection with that date arising in, say, seven days time so that we're not dealing with things right at the last minute. Those of you that have heard my presentations before will know that I'm quite defensive with regard to conveyancing because I'm concerned and I see lots of negligence claims. And one of the things that I see with regard to negligence claims is fairness not having the time to sit back and think about what to do, not having the time in order to 
uh, ensure that proper instructions are received or that appropriate documentation is submitted in the appropriate manner. The fact that we're doing things right on the last day before a time limit expires isn't a healthy sort of practice to adopt and can lead to problems and claims that wouldn't all otherwise or normally arise. So key date monitoring, again, a key CQS requirement, but making sure that that monitoring isn't simply finalizing or noting the final day to do something, but giving us time to react in good time when we're not under the same amount of pressure as we are when something has to be done today. There is a requirement for conflict of interest awareness and management. Fiona's need to understand what conflict of interest is and how it can be managed. Again, here, this sort of ties into what I mentioned earlier about taking on files and taking on work. Is it really appropriate to act for a buyer and seller in connection with the same transaction? Uh, remember that case of Grondona and Stoffel and Company where a firm of lawyers got themselves into an almighty pickle as a consequence of acting for a seller and buyer, particularly when the buyer and seller were both participating in mortgage fraud, a very, uh, a very unseemly mess for everyone concerned. My first boss was probably one of the best lawyers I've ever worked with, and his attitude always when onboarding clients or taking on new work was to make sure that the risks associated with complaints, claims, conflicts of interest and other issues were addressed right at the start and it was far better to jettison a client before formal instructions were received than taking on a client and then realising there's a conflict of interest and having to extract the firm sort of midway through a transaction and that stuck with me throughout my career to be honest with you. The, the need for supervision and the need for cover for fearners in the event of absence, in the event of sickness, holidays, etc. And again, the idea that if there is cover that's introduced, locums, etc., or we've got staff that uh, are sort of part time and able to provide cover, are those fearners up to speed with regard to the CQS systems and processes that were adopted? So if we are using locums on a regular basis, what training is there for them? What induction is there for them? And are they aware of what we're doing or not doing with regard to CQS? File review systems, again, a system for extracting files for review. It's interesting, I was just reading a book uh, from an American psychologist about various different things relating to risk, to be honest with you. And what she was saying was that, uh, you know, a good review, is absolutely useless on the basis that you know a good review telling you that that file was really well run that the client was fully aware of what was happening there was there were many delays or if there were delays everyone was aware of what's happening etc well the point that this american psychologist makes is well that, all right that's fantastic all right gives you a lovely warm glow and sends you skipping out of the office at five o'clock but how does it actually benefit the organization and how does it benefit you and the thinking is that where there is a file review that is critical, where there is disappointment, where there is room for improvement, is far more beneficial for the recipient of that review. And of course, that's just basic common sense, isn't it, when you think about it, but I think important when undertaking file reviews. So let's have a look at the client that we lost or the client that was dissatisfied or the client that was argumentative or constantly complaining. Let's look at that, let's analyze it, and let's see what we can learn from it. And as far as where we're getting good reviews, that's excellent, and we might have stats and data that we can show that 98% of our clients are exceedingly happy with the work that we do, but let's put that in a box, and let's think that from a management perspective, that's brilliant and great, and from a sort of uh, well-being perspective, fantastic. But it's actually a learning experience. It's not so good at all. So let's look at files where things went wrong. Look at files where perhaps there were issues or problems. And let's dissect what those problems are. And let's learn from it. And then let's share it. And it might be necessary then to go back to our processes and policies to have a look at what we've done to see if it's necessary as a consequence of that review process to see whether or not policies, practice, procedure, etc., requires revision as a consequence of what's been learned. As far as money laundering is concerned, there is a need for a, an individual file risk assessment. And the key question here is who performs that? Should it be a, a fearner or should it be uh, an, an officer that's dealing with money laundering? 
that uh, takes the decision as to whether or not a file is high or low risk. Again, a matter for the firm, but there needs to be some form of reporting process so that where a firm considers there is the potential for high risk, that uh, another member of the firm or the department has a look at it and again comes up with systems and processes to ensure that that risk is minimised. So again, the whole idea is that we are undertaking risk assessments, we're reviewing files, assessing high and low risk transactions, but then putting in process in, in the system methods for management of that risk and determination of that risk. And as we change the profile with regard to the work that we do, when we change profiles with regard to the types of client we're attracting, and we're changing the profile of the fairness that we've got, so we're recruiting lots of new fairness on the basis of a whole raft of new work coming in, the idea about our processes and procedures needs to be reviewed so that we are getting risk assessments done by people that are capable of undertaking the assessment and we're coming up with policies, practices and procedures as a consequence. As far as property and, uh, and, and issues with regard to mortgages, there are a number of things that I think are important. Just share some of these with you for a moment or two if I can. We've already mentioned that um, as far as onboarding clients are concerned, we should be undertaking a risk assessment with regard to the type of work that's coming on board. We've got to be aware of mortgage fraud and uh, be aware of the fact that whilst we may not act, it may not be obvious and evident that there is fraud, there might be certain types of transaction where mortgage fraud could be more prevalent. So situations where seller and buyer want, know one another or are related or where there is a sort of suspicious activity related to uh, mortgage applications, etc., before we're involved, or information that comes to hand during the life of the transaction that leads to suspicions relating to fraud. All of these things need attention. So again, when we're onboarding clients, our firmers or our sales staff or those dealing with onboarding, aware of the risk of mortgage fraud, the types of mortgage fraud that are perpetrated and what we can do to spot or identify potential problems. There should be file risk assessments relating to mortgage fraud. There should be high risk file management. And of course, we've got to be aware of sort of property fraud generally and seller identity fraud in particular. And again, I'm sorry to bleat on about this point, but it is absolutely essential that fairness that are dealing with a sale of a property always ensure that there is a connection between their seller clients, contact details given to you and the seller's details, their addresses for service that have been given to the land registry. Just reading something from the land registry recently, and what they were encouraging is that uh, sellers that owners of registered land use two email addresses as addresses for service and then have a correspondence address as well the idea being that an email address will make it easier for the land registry to contact clients in the event of risk relating to property or indeed mortgage fraud or other purposes so this line of communication between land registry and your client is important of course for the client but it's also important for you to check that the contact details that have been provided by your new client are the contact details that that client gave to the land registry. There is a need for training relating to property and mortgage fraud. And again, I was debating this issue yesterday with a number of different people. And I was saying to them, that, look, the problem with fraud, property fraud and mortgage fraud is that we're behind the times every time. So when we had all those raft of cases, dream var and Perrensing, et cetera, you know, everyone got very excited and very frightened about what had happened and about what the Court of Appeal said and about how this was sort of creating all sorts of problems for professional indemnity insurance for conveyances. But what we weren't uh, considering or appreciating was that the fraud had been perpetrated some three, four years prior to the case coming before the courts. So it was old hat, really, from the perspective of criminals and, I suppose, from the perspective of the police investing the, investigating those crimes as well. And at the moment, what we've got is a situation where, because of the amount of work that conveyances have had to do, because conveyances have been working from home, because conveyances have had access to colleagues, etc., to discuss risk on a sort of normal day-to-day -day basis when everyone's in the office, we've got the sort of perfect storm for property and mortgage fraud to be perpetrated. 
And the problem is that fraud is not going to wash out of the system until either properties are sold or properties are remortgaged or until there's a real fall in values and lenders start repossessing and then realizing that what they thought they had as security isn't security or what they thought was a genuine bona fide lender or borrower isn't so it's these sorts of things and the point i'm making very poorly to be honest with you is we're not going to know what fraudsters are about and what they're doing for a few years until things sort of wash through the system everyone is sort of getting jumpy and jittery about cyber fraud and quite rightly and about the protection of emails and our systems and processes but i'm fairly confident there'll be some sophisticated fraudsters out there some bright young things that have turned to the dark side that are coming up with all sorts of weird and wonderful methods to perpetrate fraud and we won't be aware of it for some time to come but all that said making sure that fearners are aware of what risk there is relating to property and mortgage fraud is important how do we do that looking out for cases looking out for what the police and intelligence services are disclosing and the law society are disclosing or of examples of fraud so seller identity fraud is still not commonplace but still exists i'm fairly confident that there'll be other frauds sitting out there that we'll find out about again with regard to conveyancing, the secret for conveyances is, is there something that doesn't appear to be quite right? If there is something that doesn't appear to be quite right, let's talk to our colleagues or our compliance team and see what can be done to try and determine what the problem is. And if there is risk, what is it? And can we sort of box that risk off or limit its scope and extent? Moving on, if I can. As far as SDLT is concerned, very interesting look at the changes to uh, the CQS guidance. There is a need to advise clients about the SDLT implications of a conveyancing transaction to make sure clients are aware that it might be necessary for us to charge more with regard to complex advice relating to complex SDLT situations. So we might have a situation that appears to be a straightforward residential purchase of a high value property. When we get instructions relating to that transaction, it might transpire that there are issues relating to whether or not part of the property is commercial. There may be issues on the basis that the property may be composed of more than one dwelling. There may be circumstances with regard to the client being resident abroad, owning other property, etc. That could mean there's a great deal of issues relating to SDLT that need to be carefully considered. There is nothing wrong in your firm seeking specialist advice relating to STLT in connection with complex transactions. There's an expectation that your firm will be able to advise the client in a normal residential transaction as to the STLT liability that will accrue. And there is an expectation that your firm will be able to deal with the payment of STLT, the obtaining of the appropriate receipt, so that land registration can take place after completion. But there is an understanding that SDLT can be complex and therefore with complexity, the need for specialist advice in some transactions may be appropriate and charging clients for the work that's done relating to those SDLT complications is appropriate. However, on the issue of cost, it's important that clients are made aware as soon as is possible that there are cost implications due to the complications that have arisen and that the client is given choice rather than simply charging the client at the end of the transaction more than the client expected because of SDLT complications. There is an expectation that all fearners within your organisation understand what reliefs and surcharges are potentially applicable to a transaction, although it's understood that because in, in complex transactions there may be numerous factors that specialist advice might be required to determine whether reliefs and sur surcharges actually apply there's a need for file checks relating to sdlt a need for supervision with regard to decisions calculations and advice that's given relating to sdlt and a need for client information at the start of the transaction with regard to what the sdlt implications are and that information being kept under review 
A few general principles flowing on from what I've just said about SDLT and with regard to the CQS guidance and changes that I'd like to sort of share with you. Firstly, relating to SDLT, it is absolutely essential that you have on the file or on your case management system information as to how you've arrived at a decision as to what SDLT is payable, particularly where there are reliefs or surcharges, particularly where there's a complex calculation to determine what the SDLT is. It is important that you have evidence on your file as to how you've arrived at a particular decision that you have made. It's important to record the data and information that your client provides with regard to their circumstances. So declarations, for example, that a client is a first-time buyer. Um, declarations from a client is their status with regard to uh, uh, owning of the property. Declarations or statements from the client with regard to the fact that they're not aware of anything that could constitute a linked transaction. Not necessarily every transaction, but where you're dealing with complex SDLT issues, where you're dealing with situations where clients have perhaps fairly complex uh, ownership issues or uh, are sort of wealthy and have numerous assets, residential and commercial property, as well as the property that's being acquired, it might be necessary to make sure that you've got information on file from your client, that the client understands the significance of that information, and that you're able then to react to it and deal with it. So SDLT and issues relating to SDLT are sort of highlighted in the changes to CQS as of the 1st of May. Nothing sort of startling, nothing that really should set alarm bells ringing, just in essence good practice, but again perhaps a change in emphasis and a, recogni a recognition that SDLT has become more complicated and particularly with regard to higher value properties, larger properties, etc., there may be a myriad of different issues that require addressing and that uh, it, those issues may be outside the level of knowledge of a fear in a dealing with the transaction. Nothing wrong with your firm using external advisors to assist in complex transactions. Before I leave this topic, there's one other point to, to draw to your attention, and that concerns apportionments of SDLT with regard to contents. Again, I can't emphasize enough that where there is an apportionment that has a significant impact on SDLT liability, it is imperative that there is evidence on your file, whether acting for seller or buyer, to support the fact that the valuation given to the contents that are being purchased by the buyer is a fair and reasonable valuation, some form of independent evidence. And note there, I suggest that that independent evidence is available to both the seller and buyer. Why is that significant? Well, remember, the seller's conveyancer is drafting the contract, and the buyer's conveyancer is submitting the SDLT return. Both will have consequences with regard to fraud if what the seller and buyer has done is a fraudulent apportionment in an effort to uh, reduce or extinguish SDLT liability relating to a transaction. I mentioned in my introduction that one of the things that the CQS changes have emphasized is a problem that's arisen relating to leaseholds, which isn't new to be honest with you. For from 2017 onwards, to be honest with you, the SRA have been looking at leasehold transactions and saying there's sort of been uh, a, a reluctance to grasp the nettle relating to explaining to clients the bigger picture between leasehold ownership and freehold ownership the disadvantage of being a leaseholder rather than a freeholder. And CQS have picked up on this and emphasised that the fact that practitioners that are undertaking leasehold conveyancing work need to explain to clients that are buying leasehold property the disadvantages of such a purchase. Now, I think what we've got to do in this context is divide up the type of transaction. Certainly with regard to the acquisition of leasehold houses, clients do need to be warned about the fact that there is a distinct disadvantage between owning a leasehold house and a freehold house. Explaining to clients the fact that government has a distinct lack of appetite for the creation of new leasehold house schemes and a distinct disdain for existing leasehold houses. Explaining to clients the, um, the uh, um, 
number of steps that the government has taken to try and dissuade developers from building leasehold houses, the um, number of systems and processes that are in place that uh, can encourage uh, developers and landlords of leasehold houses to sell the freehold reversion to the leasehold owner. Um, the leasehold pledge being the most obvious sort of document that sort of emphasizes this need and this sort of requirement. The disadvantage of a leasehold house owner having to pay ground rent and potentially having to pay service charge too and the distinct advantages of acquiring a freehold interest and merging the leasehold title and freehold title as a consequence. So with regard to leasehold houses I think we have to explain to the clients the dis distinction between freehold and leasehold ownership, the availability of acquisition of the reversionary interest of the freehold and the advantage of proceeding on that basis. As far as leasehold flats are concerned, I think again we need to explain the bigger picture. But here, perhaps, there is a reason why a lease of a flat or lease of an apartment uh, makes sense. Obviously, issues such as enforceability of covenant, the requirement of a landlord being responsible for structure and common parts, issues with regard to repair and maintenance of structure and common parts will all make sense. But nonetheless, there are still some disadvantages of owning a leasehold flat as opposed to owning freehold property. Namely, of course, the landlord and tenant relationship itself. Namely, the obligation to pay ground rent. And here's an interesting point. Due to the legislation that has gone through Parliament relating to the abolition of monetary value for ground rents, what I think we're going to see is a two-tier regime in connection with leasehold flats. We're going to have older leases where the ground rent will still be payable and new leases where there isn't a ground rent payable. Well, by its very nature, we're going to have a different market and an advantage in owning a new flat as opposed to a flat under the old regime. And I think the other thing that's going to be interesting is the stance that's taken by developers and landlords and builders who can't now charge a ground rent and can't therefore see a return with regard to the ownership of a reversionary interest and therefore looking at recovering a return in a different way. And the way that I see that return being recovered is by being, um, how can I say it, being cautious with regard to service charge and hiding within service charge a means of generating management fees that are in essence an indirect profit for the landlord. If a landlord is losing out with regard to ground rent, then either the landlord just accepts the position and accepts that the value, the investment potential of the reversionary interest disappears, or they look at generating some form of return elsewhere. And given the fact that landlords argued when there was talk about abolishing ground rent, that frequently ground rents were used to sort of supplement losses that were received relating to service charge, well, having management fees within service charge might just prove a new form of income stream to act as a supplement, uh, given the fact that ground rents are disappearing. I mentioned on the slide here, the Leasehold Advisory Service website, buying leasehold flats, 10 things you should check, and armour living in leasehold, armour the Association of Residential Managing Agents. Both of these leaflets are useful. The problem that I have, given what CQS is saying about leasehold properties, is this. I think that already our engagement letters and our reports on title are lengthy documents and are cumbersome. If we now have to sort of bulk up either document or both documents to give clients advice about leasehold ownership as opposed to freehold ownership and all the disadvantages associated with it, then our bulky report on title or initial engagement letter becomes significantly more bulky and less attractive to clients. Therefore, I think if we've got resources that we can use from external third parties that can explain to clients the bigger picture, explain the clients the differential between freehold and leasehold ownership and the potential disadvantages arising from leasehold ownership, the better.
So this will can supplement what we're saying to clients or telling to clients about leasehold ownership. Two other things I think I want to mention before we leave this slide. Firstly, be careful when advising clients about the term remaining on an assignment of a residential leasehold property. Of course, where a term is less than 80 years, there is an, an issue with regard to the premium that's paid to the landlord, it increases. But I would maintain that where the lease term remaining is less than 90 years, we should be flagging up the 80-year valuation issue as is a potential problem going forward. And the other point that I think is significant relating to term is that where lenders are saying that they're happy to lend on an assignment of a lease as long as the lease term is 25 years in excess of the term of the mortgage advance, that's fine from a lender's perspective, but of no real consequence as far as the borrower is concerned. I've already mentioned the fact that we're going to have a sort of dual regime relating to ground rents on the basis that we will have a situation where new leases of flats don't have uh, a ground rent and old leases do. There's an interesting question that I haven't as yet got a satisfactory response relating to this, but what happens with lease extensions on the basis that if you had a lease extension, is it now impossible to have a monetary ground rent relating to the extension given the change in legislation? My view is currently that the position should be that the um, lease the, the new lease in connection with uh, the res resident residential leases should um, not allow a sort of monetary ground rent but I'm still waiting for someone from the government to get back to me on that point there's sort of there's three three different schools of thought to be honest with you none of which are satisfactory so that's a bit up in the air in the moment and uh, as soon as I get an answer I'll let people know on the issue of service charge again particularly with regard to high-rise flats and all the sort of nightmares associated with fire safety measures, it's important that clients understand and appreciate that what was a historical service charge at five or six hundred pounds per annum, all of a sudden could well rock it as a consequence of EWS, inform EWS 1 information or fire safety measures that a landlord has imposed on them. And again, there's legislation afoot that will imply terms into residential leases that will compel landlords to introduce additional fire safety measures and there will also be implied into such leases obligations on leaseholders to pay the cost that the landlord incurs so we're going to see i think some radical changes relating to service charge we're going to see implied terms into residential leases that will have an impact on behalf of landlords and leaseholders and again, just from a general perspective relating to service charge, because of fire safety measures, because of requirements relating to remedial works that are necessary, we're going to see service charges service charge increase. We have seen, and I think we'll continue to see, insurance premiums relating to high-rise flats increases. And in addition to that, there's the sort of volatility in the marketplace. You know, just what sort of appetite is there for people to buy? flats, apartments, etc., in high-rise buildings, given all that's gone on. So again, warning clients about the volatility of the marketplace might be sensible in the context of high-rise flats. Next thing I want to talk about is that CQS uh, changes refer to the use of data analysis, a requirement of an annual assessment, and the idea that we're using not just collating data, Remember when I started my presentation, before you all lost the will to live, I was explaining to you the fact that one of the things that I think is at the very the heart of the changes to CQS is this emphasis about using the systems and processes and revising them and reviewing them. But I think the same thing applies with regard to data. So, you know, let's look at what sort of transactions we're getting involved with. Let's look at the amount of time it's taking us to deliver exchange of contracts, completion and registration. Let's look at individual fee earners and see what they're doing. Let's look at complaints. Let's look at issues relating to risk. You know, have what, what percentage of our initial risk assessments are proving correct? What uh, of our initial risk assessments are we getting wrong? And what can we do 
to make sure that uh, whatever data we're receiving, we can improve. Is it necessary to revise risk as a transaction goes on? Are there particular stages in the life of transaction where perhaps a FIANA or a supervisor should review and revise the risk? You know, just what does the data show us? What can we learn from it? How can we use it to improve our service, to improve our uh, risk relating to negligence claims and client complaints? And what can we use by way of data analysis to make the client experience better? to make our processes more efficient, more, more smooth, and to make sure that we become more profitable. As far as client care is concerned, again, an awareness, as we mentioned, about onboarding clients, being aware of client confidentiality, making sure that we communicate effectively. One of the things I'm talking to practitioners about all the time now is that what we should be doing is providing information, explanation, and providing advice. And that there is a danger is that we, as we standardize our processes, as we standardize our emails, reports on title, etc., the idea of clients being individual and being sort of real people gets put to one side. So when we talk about effective communication, making sure that when we communicate, we understand and appreciate it is a two-way process. Are we getting feedback from our clients that they understand the message that we're trying to get over? Do our clients understand the risks that we're identifying? Does our client understand the significance of the conveyancing process and the stages that must be gone through relating to that process? All of these things, again, require review, require consideration. Referrals to third parties and from third parties require management. Again, are we being transparent with regard to those referrals? Are the third parties that we're utilizing appropriate? Have we checked their systems and processes so that we're comfortable with what is being done, where referrals are being made? And again, think about, and, and again, disabled clients, yes, but just think about clients as individuals. Let's not just sort of put disabled clients in a, sort of a, a separate category. Every client is different, with different attitudes to risk, with different attitudes with regard to the conveyancing process and their relationship with you. Important that clients understand and appreciate that we can only assist and help if the clients are telling us about their needs and their requirements. So again, this applies when we're onboarding clients, but I think applies across the board with regard to the work that we're doing. So it's not just a sort of one hit when we're taking instructions, but just being constantly aware during the life of the transaction, you know, is our communication effective? Are we getting messages across in the appropriate way and in a manner that the client can understand? With regard to lenders, some points I think are important. Firstly, CQS now requires us to undertake a review with regard to the requirements of the lender's handbook before we exchange contracts. So very important that we look at our instructions when our instructions are received, but that we also undertake a review of our instructions before we exchange. And the key point here is, do we look at the lender's handbook to see if there have been any changes? Interestingly, when you look at some lenders, they change their handbook constantly. And I was looking at one lender, and I think in one month, there were 100 minor changes to their requirements of conveyances. So it is important not only that we check our instructions on receipt of instructions, but we check the lender's handbook and any changes to the handbook before we exchange contracts. And remember, lenders can alter their handbook, alter their instructions at any time. And therefore, it's important that when we are reviewing our instructions, we record the date and time of that review. So again, we are quite clear that we have information to support that we've undertaken the review and when that review took place. As far as reporting to lenders are concerned, again, one or two points that I want to share with you, one of which isn't anything to do with the CQS changes, but I think important for practitioners. Namely, um, I was talking to council about this point, and what council was saying when we were discussing, you know, should, what should you report to lenders, and what happens when lenders don't respond? And the attitude from counsel, who has a lot of experience in connection with professional negligence claims, was as follows. 
It's always wise to report to a lender anything you find as part of your due diligence process, or indeed anything else that you think may be of interest or concern to a lender. Where the lender dismisses it, where the lender doesn't take the, the blindest bit of notice of what you're saying, where the lender simply says, well, thanks very much, but we're going to rely on you to decide whether or not we should be proceeding with this transaction or not, at least you've reported it to the lender. Whereas if you work on the basis that it's not worth reporting to the lender, then at least in those circumstances, the opportunity to argue that the lender was aware is lost. So the attitude was from counsel, and I have no reason to disagree with what counsel had to say on that point, is report to lenders even when you know what you're reporting is futile and even when you know the lender is going to fire straight back to you and say well you know it's your call what i always say is when a lender says it's your call what they're basically saying is we're not bothered we'll rely on your professional indemnity insurance if you get something wrong complaint handling again cqs highlights that we need to be aware of what complaint handling involves Clients need to be aware of our processes. We need to have a regime that deals with complaints and a procedure. As far as that procedure is concerned, I always refer practitioners to the Legal Ombudsman's website that sets out a procedure that the Legal Ombudsman regards as being good practice. The key with regard to complaint handling is as follows. One, to make sure that we are recording details of complaints assessing and using data relating to complaints to see if we can improve service to see what sort of message the complaints that we're receiving are sending to us as a department or as, a, as an organization and to make sure that fearners are trained with regard to the lessons learned relating to complaint handling two points before i leave this slide point number one what I frequently see with regard to complaint handling, and this applies to legal firms, local authorities, county councils, or indeed any other organization. If complaint handling is dealt with badly, then that gives the complaining client further grounds to complain. And often an initial complaint sort of mushrooms into third world war as a consequence of poor management of the complaint in the first place. So again, this idea that uh, you know we have a department that deals with complaints is fine, but making sure fairness are aware of what causes complaints and how to manage complaints at the sort of cold face has got to be good practice. Client monitoring, important client satisfaction, but remember the point that I made, it's client dissatisfaction, I think is more important. When we're monitoring clients how do we select instructions how do we receive instructions how do we manage onboarding clients we've mentioned and being aware of conflicts of interest and making sure fairness particularly unqualified and inexperienced fairness are aware of dealing with conflicts of interest is very important indeed file and case management undertakings again i always say to practitioners never give an undertaking on the hoof particularly where you've got inexperienced staff or relatively new staff in a department, have standard forms of written undertaking that are agreed, that can be given in certain circumstances, and avoid undertakings that are given orally or that are drafted on the hoof. Making sure that we have management for live, inactive and closed files. One of the things I always say to firms is, if you're looking for new work, one of the things to do is look at files and see where clients you ha uh, you've acted for in the past, you haven't heard from them for a while, and write to them, giving them some information, perhaps about changes to land registry practice, about keeping addresses for service, etc. But then, and then just sort of drawing to the client's attention the fact you're still there and happy to assist. Documentation storage needs to be monitored and managed confidentiality with regard to information from clients needs to be managed matter progression again data with case management systems etc we're able to see the sort of uh, flow of matter progression and to see where transactions are stalling and to see what can be done relating to sort of driving deals forward interesting on monday this week i had a meeting with an australian organization that's looking at the English conveyancing practice and basically asking me all sorts of questions 
about what causes uh, transactions to stall. And uh, I think about two hours later, they got pretty bored with what I was saying, because I was going through everything and anything that I'd encountered in the past that led to transaction stalling. The moral of the tale, there isn't the one thing that sort of causes them the most um, transactions to stall. It could be anything and everything. Matter prog progression is important. Looking at the times it takes to onboard a client, to effect an exchange of contract, to complete and to register a title, and then to close a file. And on file closure, look at our systems and processes. And remember, advising clients to keep addresses for service at the land registry up to date. Advising clients in connection with co-ownership to keep up to date as to what's happening relating to a beneficial interest concerning the property. Advising clients where defective title insurance has taken place to ensure that uh, the insurer, Stuart Title or anyone else, is made aware of anything that could impact on a defective title insurance policy that has been taken out. Conclusions then. Stephen, it's question time, my favourite part of the day. While we're waiting for Stephen to fire away with questions, um, thank you again to Stuart Title. I've put on slide here uh, Robert Kelly, who's the business development manager for Stuart Title's email address. Feel free to contact Robert with any questions or queries that you might have in connection with title indemnity insurance. And uh, Stephen, if we may, I'm sure there'll be lots and lots of questions. And I am braced and ready to uh, attempt to uh, answer the questions that are put to me, knowing that my connectivity will fail dismally if there are any tricky questions that I can't answer. So over to you. Thanks, Ian. We, we have had a couple of questions. You were nearly too thorough there, though, we, but we have had a few questions in. Just as a reminder to anyone that uh, we are now going to be, begin answering questions submitted during the presentation. And you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your control panel if you wish to speak to Ian. So Ian, that's when we had a question from Emma. Um, this is to do with uh, the SDLT. Um, oh. And Emma asks, is it still appropriate for us to limit our retainer in regards to SDLT so that our calculation is based on the client's instructions? Yes. And if they yeah. do not agree, then they must get independent tax advice. There's, yeah, there's a follow-up to this, Ian, which I'll, I'll just come on to quickly, um, mm -hmm. although I think you have probably answered this. Um, and Ross, is, C, is CQS now that we must provide advice and obtain conclusions, example, contacting a tax advisor or inland revenue ourselves and charging a client for the additional work? Well, again, yeah, the point is that as far as CQS is concerned, you are required to give the client the basic advice relating to the liability to pay SDLT as a purchaser in a conveyancing transaction you are required to have some knowledge of the reliefs and surcharges that exist generally and to be able to identify a, a complex issue that would warrant or justify specialist advice. The point I think that Emma is alluding to is, well, what happens if the client says, you know, I don't want that advice, you know, I'm happy for you to sort of proceed. Well, what you should be doing in that situation is saying, look, you know, this is so complex, this is so difficult that it's outside our area of expertise and therefore you know we can't give you advice we must insist that you get advice from a third party now there are organizations there are counsel there are solicitors that will specialize in the provision of that advice all of it to be fair is not as expensive as you'd imagine and so the point Emma is you can limit the scope of your retainer so that you are telling the client that you're relying on the information that they provide to you in order to determine SDLT liability, where the transaction is complex, where the client's circumstances are complex, you are perfectly entitled to say to the client that specialist advice is required. As far as the client that then says, well, no, I don't want it, you know, I'm paying you to do the job, I think you're perfectly entitled in those circumstances to suggest to the client that uh, you can't and that the client must get independent advice the client can get that advice independent of you and of course you could get that advice on the client's behalf I hope that makes sense Stephen. it's an interesting question um my guess is that the chances of a client turning around and saying no you get on with it are pretty remote because what i would do in a situation like that is explain to a client the potential penalties if advice is wrong relating to SDLT, the surcharges, penalties, and interest that could accrue 
can be significant and therefore to warn the client about that and to advise the client that the only safe thing to do is to get specialist advice is good advice safe advice and advice that a client hopefully will listen to and will accept perfect thank you Ian, and thanks emma for that question and yes i mean it's within the question actually emma did make a very similar point to the one that you're making and so i think it really was just sort of clarification yeah. on that point but yeah. uh, no thank you nonetheless um question from brian and i also wanted to bring uh robert and i were discussing this offline actually and so i wanted to bring yeah. robert into this uh brian says uh why can't lenders be compelled to inform lawyers of changes to their part two handbook after mortgage offer stroke instructions are issued and robert i know you wanted to sort of come in make a point here yeah, yeah. just so we, Ian, you'll be aware there are now products available uh we don't supply yeah. them but uh, from search companies and so on which enable you to do an initial uh, check of the handbook and then it will update it or you can go in and do updates three or four times during a transaction um, so that you it makes it much simpler. It still puts the onus on you to find out if there are changes, um, but it does make it much easier for practitioners. And I guess, Ian, that's probably something everyone will be well advised to do on every file now. Yeah. Yeah, there, is, there are products out there. If Brian drops me a note, there's a product that, uh, although not the Stuart Title product, there's a product that uh, Stuart Title and I are, are familiar with that will do that job for you, Brian. Yeah, but you're quite right. Yeah, why, why isn't the onus on a lender to notify you of a change? Um, yeah, great point. It's just, you know, once again, unfortunately, lenders like estate agents um, have the whip hand, don't they? Well, Ian, isn't it always, unfortunately, they've got the money and we haven't, so they make the rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thanks both, and thanks, uh, Brian, for that question. Um, just one final question, Ian, and I think we will wrap up there, I'm conscious of time myself. Um, so this question from Sarah. Sarah asks, is information in a case management system, such as a workflow, sufficient enough to be a policy the new CQS requirements? Yeah, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. But if if uh, you, you drop me a note, I can ask the question and get a definitive answer. But I don't think it would be. And the other, the other thing, Stephen, is that someone asked me yesterday that are there uh, sort of new uh, sort of um, um, sort of precedents from CQS that practitioners can use? And uh, unfortunately, I, I did raise that as an issue, and I don't think there are sort of new precedents that are available as yet. Whether they will be available shortly, I'm not sure. But certainly, the last time I asked, which was last week, they won't. But you know, workflows, etc. I think on a case management system would not be enough. Oh, excellent. Okay, thank you, um, yeah. Ian, and thanks, Sarah, for that. Um, I think, as I said, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up there. We have had a couple of other questions in, but uh, I think we'll deal with those offline. Um, so in that, just like to say thank you for your time today and thank you for everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, if you have any other questions, please do contact Ian or myself. Once you do leave today's webinar, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this by now, but you will receive an automated message from GoToWebinar. This uh, message, if you reply to it, comes directly to myself so I can send on any feedback or questions directly to, to Ian. You'll also receive a separate email from my colleague Robert Kelly which will contain a copy of the slides and the notes and the recording of today's session. So I'd like to say on behalf of Stuart Title and Ian Quayle, thank you everyone for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Goodbye.